Okay, everybody, from a New York-centered point of view, at least, good afternoon. If you happen to be you know, further west, so good morning still, Other, or good evening for those of you who are logging in from Israel and South Africa and all those cool places. So Zoom definitely has its advantages. Uh, today, I believe I resumed the recording, so that's cool. Um, I'm going to try to do this. No, that doesn't do what I was hoping it would do. I've, if everybody, if you don't mind just putting yourselves on mute, most of you have automatically done that as you logged in. I think a couple of people, okay, so anyway, I'm just going to do it like this for now and we'll see how it all goes. Today's topic is the uh, resident alien, which is a very important topic. I didn't realize actually how important it was for the Judaism and humanity scheme until I prepared a class on it just this past year and realized, wow, this is actually lies at the heart of what we were talking about. Last week, we dealt with the chosen people. Next week, we'll deal with prophetic visions of the messianic era and what the relationship between Israel and the nations is. So this middle one is on the resident alien. So before we even begin the biblical perspective, I hope that you all have the source sheets that I sent out yesterday, and I recently sent it to a few of you minutes ago. If not, this is an excellent time to let me know that. But in the meantime, we're going to go ahead. Uh, very important method point. In Jewish tradition, there are two Torot. There are two Torahs, even though it's hard to fathom that and often creates complications. But all the same, it's really important to have this baseline understanding of what we're talking about. There's the written law. These are the five books of Moses, the actual Torah itself. That's what we take out in synagogues. That's what is, you know, that's the ancient divinely given text from God to Moshe way back in the day, back at Mount Sinai and throughout the desert experience. And that's the written law. Accompanying that written law, as any believing Jew understands, there is something called the oral law. The oral law, strictly defined, refers to divine teachings to Moshe that go all the way back. More loosely defined, it includes thousands of years of rabbinic interpretation of that authoritative teaching. And the rabbis of the Talmud already, which is the heart and hub of the oral law, they often themselves don't know where one of those two things stops and the next one starts. They're not always sure exactly where the divine piece ends and where human interpretation comes in. So normative Judaism for the last, since the giving of the Torah has accepted a binding authoritative layer of some oral law. We don't always know which things originate with God and Moshe in that era and which things go to an ancient layer of rabbinic interpretation. Be that as it may, it's important to understand that they are binding in Judaism, but they're different. It's also important to understand that there is a forceful debate that goes back to the medieval period, specifically regarding legal texts of the Torah, when you, or halachic texts, to use a word that, you know, in rabbinic terminology, but just legal texts. There are many laws in the written law. We all know that. Good. Now, the question is, is the plain sense of those laws, is that always the law? Or is it possible to have legal texts in the Torah that don't reflect applied law in Judaism? Just an easy example, which is not today's topic, but boy, oh boy, a great topic for some future talk, uh, is an eye for an eye. Okay, so the Torah says an eye for an eye. Anybody who knows basic normative rabbinic teaching understands very well that the oral law rules that we don't poke the guy's eye out, or if it's a woman, we don't poke her eye out either. We don't poke a person's eye out in the event that A pokes B's eye out. Rather, we sue for financial compensation in the courts. Okay, but the question is now, can the expression an eye for an eye in the Torah still mean poke eye out? Or must it mean what the oral law tells us it means? That's a forceful debate in the medieval period already, where champions such as Rabbi Abraham, Ibn Ezra maintained, if the oral law tells us that eye for an eye means monetary compensation, that must mean what the Torah itself means. Because how could there be a gap between a God-given law and the oral law, which is also God-given? Okay, so that's very reasonable indeed. Despite that incredibly reasonable sounding posture, uh, other great first top tier interpreters, such as Rashbam, Rabbi Shmuel Ben Meir, who was one of Rashi's illustrious grandsons, but also a fabulous interpreter in his own right, as well as Ramban, that's Rabbi Moshe Ben Nachman, and many others also, insist that there can be a layer of meaning of a written law, which is not the law. 
In other words, it's at least possible that an eye for an eye means poke the guy's eye out, but we don't really do that. Oh, what happens if there's a gap between the written and the oral law? The answer is that the written law must be coming to teach some value or lesson. So in this case, Ibn Ezra followed by Rambam, Maimonides, Rabbi Moshe ben, Nach, uh, ben Maimon, they understand that eye for an eye comes to teach, you deserve to have your eye knocked out, but we're not really going to do that. In other words, that the literal reading of a legal text is not to give you the law, but rather some other value, in this case, value of fairness, but the courts won't do that because the oral law insists that we have monetary compensation. Okay, not just method background, but you need that method background because today's shiur, today's talk is completely revolving around the idea that there is a layer of biblical law, which is extensive. It's not just three words, an eye for an eye, which in Hebrew is just ayin tachat ayin, that's three Hebrew words. Here it's much more extensive than that. There are dozens of verses in the Torah which seem to all mean one thing in the written law, but then the oral law completely reinterprets all of them to a totally different category, okay? And that is a ger. The Hebrew word is ger. That's it, voila, gimel resh. These two letters cause a lot of, of confusion because they mean one thing in the Tanakh, in the Bible, including the legal text of the Torah, but they mean something completely different in oral law. Okay, so here goes. In the oral law, there are two categories of what we call a ger. One category is what we think of today as a convert. Somebody who converts to Judaism, somebody who was born not Jewish, who then willingly accepts the Jewish peoplehood and religion and become fully part of the Jewish people. In Hebrew, that category is called a ger tzedek. Okay, that's the halachic term for what we call today a convert, okay? In all of the Bible, at least in the plain sense of what the written text means, ger never means ger tzedek, okay? Just important to be aware of that. It always means the other one, which I'll tell you right now, that is the resident alien. The ger in the Tanakh is always exclusively a ger toshav in halacha. So in, Hebrew, in English, we call that a resident alien. And in Hebrew, we call that a ger toshav. I'm just chatting away over here. Okay, ger in the Tanakh, or including in the Torah itself, always refers to this kind, meaning somebody who's a non-Israelite, somebody who's not part of the Jewish people, but who lives in the land of Israel. Okay, that's the resident alien. So he's not a citizen, but he lives there permanently. He's not a businessman who just passes through. He's not on temporary leave for some reason or another. He's not a tourist. This is somebody who lives in the land of Israel of non-Jewish origin who remains non-Jewish, to use our words. And that's the Ger Toshav. Okay, so in Tanakh, in the, in the Torah and the rest of the Bible, this is somebody who, that, that every time the word Ger appears in the Tanakh, that's what it means. Okay, all Ger means is somebody who lives in a land that does not belong to him or to her or a resident alien. We have that meaning, now come the source sheets, just to demonstrate this meaning across the boards. So Abraham, at this point, he's not even called Abraham yet. He's still Abraham. He's still, he hasn't gotten his divine name change as of yet in this story. He said to Abram, know well that your offspring shall be strangers in a land not theirs. The Hebrew word for strangers is gerim. I mean, with ger, but ger is in, used in the collective plural here. And they shall be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. What matters is that God is telling Abraham that his descendants will be strangers in a land that does not belong to them. Obviously here, ger doesn't mean that the Israelites are going to convert to become believers in the Egyptian religious system. It simply means they will live in a land that does not belong to them. Nothing to do with religious beliefs. It has to do with where you are. I mean, the homeland of the people of Israel is the land of Israel. And God is promising Abraham that they, the, his descendants will be living in a land that does not belong to them. That's all Ger means. Ger means somebody who lives in a land that does not belong to him. Say, similarly, God teaches the people of Israel that they don't even own the land of Israel. That's source number two. But the land must not be sold beyond reclaim, for the land is mine. You are but strangers resident with me. Or in Hebrew, ki gerim v'toshavim atem imadi. Meaning on a technical legal level, the people of Israel don't even own the land of Israel. The land of Israel belongs to God and God permits and blesses the people of Israel to live there when everything is right. And that's why they must leave the land un, 
planted for one out of every seven years, what we call the Shemitah or the sabbatical year. And likewise, every 50 years, the land reverts to its original owners called the Yovel year or very helpfully translated into English as Jubilee. And then, but God is simply teaching, you don't really own the land of Israel. You simply are resident aliens in your own land because the land ultimately belongs to God. So once again, this is not a religious point. I mean, it's all religious law, but it has to do with living in a land that does not belong to you. Okay, so that so far so good. It's, it's really a very straightforward thing. Every single instance of ger in the Torah means somebody who doesn't live in a land that belongs to him. So with regard to the ger, who is the purpose, the subject of today's talk, a ger is somebody who's a non-Israelite who lives in the land of Israel. It has nothing to do with adopting the religion of Israel, meaning it's not what we call today a convert, somebody who's a ger tzedek, but rather somebody who simply lives in the land of Israel who is not of Israelite stock. Okay. Now, now that we have that settled, and I believe that it is a settled issue, I don't think that it is a fair read of any legal text to say that it refers on the written level, on the written law level, to what we call today a convert to Judaism. It always refers to the ger tosha. That's simply what ger means in the Bible. Well, now that we have ger, we have all kinds of legal texts with regard to the ger who is a non-Israelite who lives in Israel. What can we learn about such a ger? Well, we have all kinds of different sources. One is source three in Parshat Mishpatim in Exodus chapter 22. You shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him for you are strangers in the land of I in Egypt. It's complete symmetry. Just as you were gerim in Egypt, meaning you lived in a land that did not belong to you, you should have a heightened sensitivity to people who are non-Israelites who live in the land of Israel. And Rashi there says, here I only have the Hebrew, somebody who did, wasn't born there, a foreigner. Somebody who now lives there who is not a naturalized citizen of the land. And that's correct. Rashi is saying exactly what the pshat, what the plain sense of the text is here. And this applies across the boards. Okay. So one law is we can't oppress the ger. Okay. So far that's pretty bland, but then it becomes a lot grander in source number five and six. When a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall not wrong him. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as one of your citizens. You shall love him as yourself. Okay, that's a many, many notches above don't oppress the person. Now it is love the stranger as much as you love yourself. It's in the same chapter, by the way, as love your neighbor as yourself. So love your neighbor refers to fellow Israelites. And love the stranger refers to other people, non-Israelites who live in the land of, of Israel, who are there. You have to love them as you love yourself too. So two of the three commandments to love anybody in the Torah are in this chapter. There's only one other commandment to love anybody, and that is in the Shema. We have to love God also, right? But those are the three. Love our neighbor, love the stranger, love God, in whatever order you choose to, to make them. So the Torah creates a symmetry between Israelites must love fellow Israelites. That's love your neighbor as yourself. And then you have love the stranger in the same chapter, which is what we have over here. And source six similarly says, in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, for the Lord your God is God supreme and Lord supreme, the great, the mighty, and awesome God who shows no favor and takes no bribe, but upholds the cause of the fatherless and the widow, befriends the stranger, providing him with food and clothing. You too must befriend the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Okay, and befriend is a very tame translation. This is taken from the JPS. Uh, but in the Hebrew, once again, it's you have to love the ger. It's a much stronger language in the Hebrew than it is with befriend. So the Torah makes very clear that the ger is somebody who must not be oppressed or discriminated against in any way, but even loved the way that we love fellow Israelites. So far, so good. And uh, the Talmud actually counts a minimum of 36 references scattered throughout the whole Torah where we have to love and take care of and not oppress the ger. Again, the oral law is going to have its own understanding of all of that, but for the time being, the plain sense of the text is that we must love and not oppress and treat fairly the ger, somebody who's a non-Israelite living in the land of Israel. Okay, so far so good. That establishes a pretty basic baseline. But that alone, that alone, I think we could all just nod our heads and say, yeah, that feels right. Good. Or at least I hope we all think that it all feels right. As, as of the second, we have 53 people. I may, I don't know if I count as one of those people. I think I do. There's 52 other people. So I hope you all agree with me because otherwise, oh my goodness, we're never going to get anywhere further than that. <laughs> But what's more fascinating, at least to me, and shocking, because the oral law doesn't interpret it this way, is what the ger is obligated to do. 
When I say ger, again, keep on stressing this, it means the resident alien, the non-Israelite who lives in the land of Israel, not a convert to Judaism, okay? So we have, first of all, that they're equal under the justice system, source number seven. You shall have one standard for stranger and citizen alike, for I, I the Lord, am your God. Okay, so that is just in the courts, everybody has the same rules. There's, there's nobody who gets a higher treatment than anybody else in the land of Israel. So far, cool. But then when you start seeing what a ger has to do or not do, it's actually remarkable. Source eight, shivat yamim, sorry. No leaven shall be found in your houses for seven days, for whoever eats eats what is leaven, that person shall be cut off from the community of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a citizen of a country. Meaning, get this straight, a non-Jew living in Israel must not eat chametz on Pesach and is under the same severe ban that a Jew is. Okay, that already, I wasn't expecting that just because Jewish law doesn't uphold this. The oral law is going to take all of this in a very different direction. But in the text of the Torah itself, the ger is prohibited from eating chametz or leaven on Pesach as much as a Jew is, okay? Or, here's another good one, source nine, right in the Ten Commandments. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave or your cattle or the stranger who is within your settlements. Everybody living in the land of Israel must observe Shabbat. Jew or non-Jew, Right? Okay, that's all. That, that, right here in Smack in the Ten Commandments, the stranger again is the ger. This is the resident alien, is now blocked from doing melacha, doing any constructive labor as defined by the oral law on Shabbat. Or, source 10, and this shall be a law to you for all time. This is the law of what we call Yom Kippurim or Yom Kippur colloquially. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall practice self denial. You shall do no manner of work, neither the citizen nor the alien who, who resides among you. Okay, he also has to observe Yom Kippur. But wait, there's more. Source 11, every seven years, they had a national gathering in what became Jerusalem, where the sections of the Torah was publicly written by a very high official. Ju according to Jewish law, it was the king. According to Josephus, he reported that it was the high priest. Whoever it was, it was somebody right at the top of the, of the totem pole. It was somebody very high up in the, in the societal pecking order, read publicly Torah on Sukkot, at following the Shemitah year, following the sabbatical year. And the commandment itself goes back to the, the book of Deuteronomy in source 11, gather the people. Who has to attend? The answer is men, women, children, and the strangers in your communities. Every single citizen and stranger, meaning non-Jews and non-Jews, men, women, children have to come and hear a public Torah reading by either the king or the high priest, some very high official. There is absolutely no distinction made. Oh, the Torah is for the Jews. So the Jews should come and hear this. Of course, the Jews should come and hear this. But the shocking part is, so too, non-Jews living in Israel must attend. That's the commandment. Okay. Not only that, but Jews and non-Jews living in Israel may bring sacrifices in the central shrine. Originally, that was the tabernacle, the Mishkan. Eventually, that got replaced by the temple built by King Solomon. That's source 12. And when throughout the ages a stranger who has taken up residence for you or one who lives among you would present an offering by fire of ple pleasing odor to the Lord, as you do, so it shall be done. The rest, of, the rest of the congregation, there shall be one law for you and the resident stranger. It's very clear. There's no difference in sacrificial law between Jew and non-Jew. Everybody is entitled to come to the temple and bring sacrifices. The Torah is very open and explicit about every single one of these laws. Okay. And let's move all the way over to source number 13. And if a non-Jew sins, any severe sin that Jews are not allowed to do, source number 13, for the citizen among the Israelites and for the stranger who resides among them, you shall have one ritual for anyone who acts in error. But the person, be he citizen or stranger, who acts, defi acts defiantly reviles the Lord, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Jew and non-Jew must observe all severe prohibitions in the Torah. And, and that's it. There's no distinction made whatsoever because he has spurned the word of the Lord and violated his commandment. That person shall be cut off. He bears his guilt. Same threat to both Jew and non-Jew living in Israel. I don't know about you, but when I piled all these things together in preparation of this, of this talk, I was flabbergasted. I couldn't believe that non-Jews living in Israel, according to the written law, which we don't apply in law, but basically non-Jews have to keep the entire Torah. If they live in Israel, there's no, there's no, if they live anywhere else, they're not under any of these obligations. 
but at least the way the Torah describes the law, not only, not only must they be protected and have equal justice under the law and not be oppressed and even be loved by fellow citizens and cared for, but they, they're obligated to keep Jewish law. They're obligated to keep what we think of as the 613 mitzvot of the Torah. And if they don't, they're under serious threat, just like, just like native born Jews are. This is astonishing. Okay, now let's, let's all enjoy that astonishment. And now get, let's look at the chat just to see if I can address some of these. Even Ezra was concerned with the Karaite. That is certainly true. And that might indeed have influenced his interpretive posture. Although to be fair, it's also a very sensible posture, even if you're not battling against Karaites. It's very reasonable to say that the oral law, why would it come up with something different from what's explicitly written? Ibn Ezra's argument is that a living tradition should tell us what those words mean when there's ambiguity. So I think that there's sense. It's actually very cogent. It's much harder to explain the other side, right? How could it be that there's a written law given by God in the Torah that isn't the law, right? So that team has to, a lot more explaining to do. But this shiur is based on the fact that there most certainly is a gap between the written law and the oral law. I'm, I'm counting on Rashbam and Ramban and all the others in, in by saying that, no, I don't think that the oral law matches the written law at all. Okay, so very good. Next. But Rashbam didn't have to fight the Karaites in France. Ibn Ezra did. In I space. completely agree with the historical circumstance and that very well may have weighed in. I'm just saying that even yeah. if you're not living yeah. in 12th century Spain and you're not fighting Karaites, the, yeah, the, no, I agree the itself is quite, is quite yeah. cogent. I don't think that it's a... That doesn't ex preclude polemical motives also. I'm just saying that the position itself makes sense even if you don't know about Karaites at all. And even if Ibn Ezra didn't know about Karaites, you could see a prominent rabbinic figure approaching that position. The Gera Rebbe has nothing to do with the Gera that we're talking about right now. Um, what about a resident alien in Israel who converts? Does the Torah address this? Or is it only anecdotal like Ruth? Uh, there's, there's no record of any concept of formal conversion to Judaism in the Bible, including Ruth. Ruth is the closest thing that we have to a prototype of what we think of as conversion to Judaism. But even that, we don't know, did she go to a mikvah? I don't know. Uh, the book of Ruth is hardly, whatever she needed to do to marry Boaz, she did. And she is an incredibly admirable person whom I love very deeply. She's incredible. That all being said, we don't know if there was a formal process of conversion that she went through to make her what we would call a gioret, the way that we have it in halacha. We just don't know. So was there such a possibility in biblical Israel? Maybe, and, and maybe even for sure, I don't know. But what all I can tell you is that Ruth definitely did whatever was required to marry Boaz legitimately so that they can have offspring such as King David, for example. So it definitely worked, but, but I don't know what the mechanisms in place were at that time. Thinking back on Perry's point, the national religion, yeah, they would, as long as, as long as they're moral, which we'll get to. In other words, and, and, but for sure, those who are ethical people would definitely be it wouldn't be halachic ger toshav. We don't have a halachic ger toshav today. But at the very least, we should treat them in the same way. That, that 100% agreed. So I'm with Smotrich, at least on that particular point, regardless of whatever I think about his other points. And so, good. So far, so good. So now we've established ger in the Torah always means a resident alien. The ger must be treated with respect, loved, not discriminated against, treated equally under the law in the courts and also seems to have to observe nearly all the commandments that an Israelite does. It's, it's truly amazing. And it's all according to the written law, which again, we don't apply to the Ger Toshav in Halakha, but we're not up to that piece yet. Uh, but then we find exceptions. Evidently, the Ger Toshav doesn't have to keep all 613 commandments. So source number 14 shows up and fakes me out the other way now. Now that I'm expecting that the Ger has to keep everything, I'm very startled to hear he's allowed to eat not kosher meat. Right, so here we go in source 14. You shall not eat anything. We just read this this past Shabbat, this past Shabbat was Re'e. So here you go, good, good, timely, good timely parashat HaShavua thing. You shall not eat anything that has died a natural death, meaning what we call karyan or nevela in halacha. Give it to the stranger in your community to eat. You give it to the ger. Wait a second, fake out. I thought a ger at this point has to observe all the mitzvot of the Torah, but obviously, no, he does not, or no, she does not, because here he's munching away on a cow drops dead of old age. Okay, so a Jew can't eat that anymore. It's nevelah. 
but a non-Jew may eat it, a, a gear, or you may sell it to a foreigner. A foreigner we had no problem with because they're living outside of Israel. You could export the meat, but now we find out that a gear may eat carrion. There's another distinction in law between the na native-born Israelite citizen and the gear. Source 15, you may also buy them from among the children of aliens resident among you or from the, their families that are among you whom they begot in your land. They, they, these shall become your property. You may keep them as a possession for your children after you, for them to inherit as property for all time. Back in the good old days, well, the good old days weren't all good. There was such an institution as slavery, right? The Torah tolerates slavery. That's a good shiur in its own right, but not today's shiur. But what matters for our purposes is that a Hebrew slave, an Eved Ivri, cannot serve as a slave forever in Israel because God insists. Because the people of Israel are God's servants and therefore they must not be slaves to one another. So in the Jubilee year, even if they had debt slavery, they must go free at the end of, after the Jubilee year. Whereas that is not so with a Ger. A Ger can be a permanent slave. There's no obligation that a person does not go free in the Jubilee year. Okay, so here's another legal distinction between Israel, because they're God's servants, can, Israelites must not be permanent slaves, whereas the ger can be. Okay, so that's another distinction in law between a ger and an Ezrach. Ezrach is an Israelite. Okay, source 16, here's another one. If a stranger who dwells with you would offer the Passover to the Lord, all his males must be circumcised. Then he shall be admitted to offer it. He shall then be as a citizen of the country, but no uncircumcised person may eat of it. There shall be one law for the citizen and for the stranger who dwells among you. Okay. Ibn Ezra understands this passage, and it seems like the best reading of the passage, that a ger doesn't have to ever bring a Passover sacrifice. There's no commandment. For an Israelite, boy, oh boy, is it commanded. And in fact, it's a very serious affront and offense not to bring one. Okay. So Israelites must circumcise their males. And then they must bring the Korban Pesach. So if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, this is the only meat you ever have to eat. You must eat one olive's worth of that sheep or lamb on Pesach, and that's it. And then you're good for the rest of the year. You can eat all the bean sprouts you want, whatever other stuff suits your fancy. But in the meantime, but a non-Israelite, a non-Ezrach or a Ger, doesn't have to circumcise males and doesn't have to bring the Korban Pesach. But if you want to bring the Korban Pesach, then you need to circumcise your males first. That's the way the Torah sets it up. So in other words, a ger is exempt from circumcision and also exempt from the Passover sacrifice. But then again, but if you want to bring one, you're welcome to, but then you have to circumcise your males. Those two commandments go together as covenantal law. Okay, so I think we're in a good place in terms of, oh wait, one other exception, and then we'll, then we'll move into the oral law. There's one other seeming exemption for a ger in the Torah, even though it's not as explicit as the other ones that I've mentioned, and that's in source 17 with regard to Sukkot, meaning the sitting in a booth on the holiday of Sukkot, okay? You shall live in booths seven days. All citizens in Israel shall live in booths. It doesn't say citizen and stranger alike, right? It just says that citizens of Israel, meaning Israelites, must sit in Sukkot, which seems to suggest that a ger doesn't have to do this thing. And Rashbam, Rabbi Shmuel ben Meir, who's one of the heroes of the methodology of today, but he also, he comments on this verse. He says, there's a reason for this. The whole reason we sit in a Sukkot is, to, is a Sukkah is to remember our experience in the desert. And that is unique to the people of, Is the people of Israel. The Ger, even if he's living in the land of Israel, didn't have that experience. It's simply a historical fact that the Ger wasn't involved in the journey through the desert for 40 years and didn't live in Sukkot or didn't have the clouds of glory over him, depending on how you wish to interpret why we sit in a Sukkah. And so Rashbam explains that's why only Israelites are commanded to sit in a Sukkah on Sukkot. I don't think there's any prohibition if a non-Jew, if a Ger resident alien wants to. That's why, that's why such a person would be exempt from this law. Okay, so now we have the legal summary, it was a good survey here, of many different laws that a, a non-Jew or what we call a resident alien, the Ger Toshav must observe, and there are many, but not all, right? Non-Jew, Ger Toshav may eat carrion, nevela, may bring the Passover sacrifice and circumcise, and then must circumcise males if does that, but doesn't have to circumcise males or bring Passover sacrifice ever, is exempt from the sukkah. 
and hypothetically could be a slave permanently, whereas Israelites must be, must go free in the Jubilee year. Those are the distinctions in the written law. But we don't base any halachic rulings on the written law. The oral law is what governs Jewish law. Okay. In the oral law, there is a wholesale redefining of everything. Okay, so get ready for this wholesale redefining of everything. According to the oral law, 99% of the verses I just read to you refer exclusively to the Gerd Sedek or the convert. And they do not at all apply to the resident alien. So when it says that a Ger must observe Shabbat, that means a convert to Judaism must observe Shabbat. When it says that a Ger must not do work on Yom Kippur, that refers to a convert to Judaism who must not do work. When it says that a Ger must observe all the other things that we talked about, must not eat chametz on Pesach, that refers to a convert. When it says that we must love the ger, that refers to loving a convert to Judaism. None of these laws govern the ger toshav, the resident alien. Because all of a sudden, these laws are almost all applied exclusively to the ger tzedek. The one time where the rabbis couldn't do this was with the permission to eat carrion, or nevela, right? A convert to Judaism can't eat not kosher food any more than a, a born Jew. So that one has to refer to the ger toshav, to the resident alien. Okay, but other than that, forget it. 99% of these references that we've looked at suddenly are, are carried over into the category of the ger tzedek, and exclusively the category of ger tzedek, which means that suddenly I have very little information on, well, what does a ger toshav need to do? If somebody is living in the land of Israel, a non-Jew lives in Israel, what does that person need to do? What are a Jew's obligation toward that resident alien? Suddenly, I don't know. Before it was love him, love him, love him, don't oppress, all these things. Now suddenly those things are all about the Ger Tzedek, the convert, and they're not about the Ger Toshav. So suddenly I'm, I'm left hanging with this important category, non-Jews living in the land of Israel under Jewish sovereignty. And all these verses that I thought really helped us here suddenly are, are taken away by the oral law. The oral law has become the binding authoritative ruling on how we apply the laws of the Torah. One particularly interesting example, just so you can see the gap between written and oral law, is going all the way back to bum, 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 source number five. So I mentioned that in Leviticus chapter 19, you have earlier in the chapter, love your neighbor as yourself. And then later in this chapter, it says in source five, when a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall not wrong him. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as one of your citizens. You shall love him as yourself. So I had it going great back in the written law part of this talk. Okay, there are two verses. One talks about Israelites must love fellow Israelites. That's our neighbor. And then this passage in source five is that you also have to love the resident alien. That was so simple. But suddenly the oral law tells me that source five is also is about the convert to Judaism. So wait a second, isn't the convert to Judaism now my neighbor? So why, and if it is, I think that that person is my neighbor, that, that's a fellow Jew now. Well, then why do you need another verse telling you to love the convert? We already have it. You love the convert the way you would love any other Jew. So Oral law rules, and Rambam rules this way, simply because the oral law takes it this way. And there's a double commandment to love the convert. You have to love a convert as we love every other Jew. Plus, there's a bonus commandment to love the convert because of the potential for discrimination against the convert. That's not Pshutosh Shal Mikrat. That's not the plain sense of the text. The plain sense of the text is that we have two categories of person, the born Jew and the resident alien. They're two totally different people living in the land of Israel. But the oral law has interpreted both of these laws exclusively with regard to converts to Judaism. And as a result, Allah understands that there's a double commandment to love the convert. Okay. So, so far, so good. And, and again, now we have, some, we have other work to do right now. But let's just summarize. There are two fundamental, and then I'll go back to the chat and see what's happening over there. There are two fundamental differences between the written law on the ger and the oral law on the ger. Okay, the written law on the ger, there are tons of obligations that Jews have toward non-Jews living in the land of Israel. And there are also tons of obligations that these non-Jews have to do. They have to observe a very hefty percentage of the Torah. So those are two big legal categories in the written law. According to the oral law, there is almost no coverage of how do we treat the non-Jew living in the land of Israel? Because all of those verses refer to the convert to Judaism now, right? And also we have very little sense from the Torah of what may a non-Jew 
living in Israel, what laws govern that person? I thought I had a huge roster of them for you. That's what we went through. But the oral law takes those and puts them in the category exclusively of Ger Tzedek to the convert, which leaves very little to go on for the Ger Toshav. Okay, so those are the two, those are the two major transitions between written law and oral law. Now let's go over to some chat action. What does the Nechata Nefesh Me'ama have to do with the Ger Toshav? It depends what karet is. So the soul shall be cut off. It's a, it's a good question, but I can't answer it because there's a debate over what exactly karet is. But whatever it is, it's a very severe, divinely given punishment that frankly I don't want and you don't want. So whatever it is, a non-Jew living in Israel doesn't want to incur karet any more than a Jew wants to. But we don't know exactly what it is. Exactly. Sorry, my question was Amma. Who is his Am? Uh, presumably, okay. very good. I, so your question is good. Presumably, Am um, refers more to the people of Israel, just because that's the usual formula in the Torah. But the Torah is also letting us know that non-Jews are under that ban also. Non-Jews likewise mu must not sin egregiously like that, even if you're right. Technically, there's a problem. That, that's a great observation on the text level. I was explain how they managed to change the meaning. Here we run into that fuzzy area of, did the rabbis change the meaning? Or is this oral law that goes all the way back? So the rabbis, as often is the case, including here, don't explain which of those two things it is, right? Which is why when somebody asked about Ruth before, I, I had to give this incredibly vague answer because we don't know how far back the formal standards of conversion go. We know that they're there from the time of the Mishnah, but the question is, did the rabbis of the time of the Mishnah invent them because there was no formal conversion to Judaism prior to that? Or were they simply applying or modifying an earlier pre-existing set of conversion laws that simply never appear in the written text of the Bible? And that we can't, we don't know, okay? There are a few references in Israel, it's actually written, Ger Toshav, how does the oral law interpret these? Uh, Ger Vitoshav means Ger Toshav, and Usually that's, it's not in the context of legal texts. Ger Toshav has much more to do with the standing. Like Avraham, when he wants to buy a grave for Sarah, calls himself Ger Toshav. He's a Ger Toshav. It just means that he's a resident alien among the Hittites. And so he can't own land. So he has to find some gimmick with them to get the cave in the field to bury Sarah. So the, most of the time that the word Ger appears, it means Ger Toshav. That's the only kind of Ger that you have in the written law. Okay, next. Ki gerim hayitem also take on a different meaning depending on the choice of who to apply to. When it says hayitem, it means you. It's referring to God speaking to the people of Israel. It's a way of saying that the Israelites should have an, addition, an extra sensitivity toward resident aliens because we were resident aliens also. That's usually how that term is applied in the Torah. As redefinition of source five, because you were gerim in Mitzrayim. Uh, it doesn't have to. I mean, you're, you're right. On, you're mixing shot and oral law here. Right, in other words, at the shot level, it's clear that my reading was a really good one. But at the oral law level, once it's reinterpreted, you don't have to explain what every single verse means. They have a, pro they have a bigger problem, which is, again, the redundancy with love your neighbor as yourself. That's what I was talking about before. So the oral law isn't worried about that redundancy. The oral law is like, okay, but that's what the law, that's how we apply the law. So asking shot questions against oral law often runs into that wall, which is why I'm happy that Rashbam and Ramban told us that I can give the shiur and say that there can be an independent layer of meaning of the written law, even if we don't apply that law, because that way we can keep the pshat, we can keep the plain sense intact while still upholding the oral law. Okay, again, why did oral law interpret here differently? Same question. I don't know if it interprets it or if God is telling you this is how to apply it. Jeremy asks, hello, Jeremy. How can, that's my nephew, uh, how can the word, how can the word ger in one pasuk have different meanings? Love the ger because you were gerim in Egypt. It has the same meaning. It's an excellent question. Ger simply means somebody who lives in a land that does not belong to him. So just as the people of Israel lived in Egypt and therefore, and they, they didn't own Egypt, they were strangers there. So too, non-Israelites living in the land of Israel are not landowners, and, but they live in our land. Okay, so ger in both cases means exactly the same thing. Somebody who lives in a land that does not belong to him or to her. Okay, isn't that the point? Obligations of non-Jews of the Noahide laws. Yes, and we're going to get back to that. Stay tuned. Uh, seems to be legal. Uh, I don't know. Can you just clarify, Alexander ben Alil, if you can clarify your question, I'm not sure what you mean, but we will get there. Okay, so we're gonna move on while, while that takes care of. Okay, so I think we're up to date on the traffic. I call that chat traffic. I think it's a good way of managing
large group discussion, even with a lot of people. I think it's, it's an excellent feature of Zoom that I've used from the very beginning. And I think it's a great way to have participation without that taking over the whole shiur so we can keep the flow going. Uh, now we have to talk about the gap between the written and the oral law. <laughs> okay, because there's a big gap between the written and the oral law. And again, the two major areas are how Jews are supposed to treat non-Jews in their land. The written law has many things to say about that. The oral law has almost nothing to say about that because all of these laws are applied only to the Ger Tzedek or the convert to Judaism. Uh, and the other one is what non-Jews living in Israel have to do, where the Torah gives lots of mitzvot, lots of commandments to the resident alien. And suddenly Jewish law, the oral law takes that almost all of those to refer to uh, the Ger Tzedek, the convert. So somebody wrote a nice article about this particular piece. And I'm going to expand on it, but I'm going to give him credit first. Rabbi Yehuda Rock at Yeshivat Haaretzion. So you can find it online. Rabbi Yehuda Rock wrote an article at the, at the virtual Beit Midrash of Yeshivat Haaretzion. So he says that the Torah has two goals. And these two goals are one. Clearly, the Torah wants everybody living in the land of Israel to be unified. There's one law for the land. And everybody has to be treated well in this land. And everybody has to be loved. It's very clear that one of the values of the written law is equal treatment of everybody who lives in the land of Israel and equal law that applies to everybody. That's one value. The other value, which is also in the Torah, is that God and Israel have a unique relationship. Okay? And which is not like everybody else. And, and so, and that's a critical value also within the Torah. Specifically with regard to the permission of a, of a ger to eat carrion or nevela, it comes up in the context of the people of Israel are a holy people to God and they're God's children. So the idea is that even non-Jews living in the land of Israel, as much as we love them and treat them equally under the law and they have many obligations, uh, they don't have that unique covenantal relationship with God that applies from the Torah and all through the rest of the Tanakh. So I liked what Rabbi Rock said, and I'll, I, I just want to extend it to all of the other differences that we've seen. We've seen that the resident alien, according to the written law, must observe many, many laws of the Torah, but not eating carrion because that's part of the co unique covenantal status of the people of Israel. So too with circumcision and Passover sacrifice. Now this is already me. I'm taking Rabbi Rock and running with him. All right. These are unique covenantal laws to the people of Israel, meaning there's no demand that every man in Israel and the land of Israel has to be circumcised. And same thing with the Passover sacrifice. That is a unique historical moment where God redeemed the people of Israel. And the same thing applies, as Rosh already says, to the Sukkah. Since the people of Israel wandered through the desert. OK, so that's a unique historical experience that we had with God that anybody else living in the land of Israel did not have. So it very well explains why they don't do that. And even with regard to slavery, the idea that since God has a unique relationship with Israel and therefore Israel are God's slaves and therefore they cannot be permanent slaves, even that would apply as a distinction with non-Jewish people living in the land of Israel back in the days of having slavery. Okay? So that's what we have. And what that ends up meaning is we have to figure out oral laws and now figure out what to do with the Ger Toshav because there's so little, the resident alien, there's so little. So in Masechet Avodah Zarah and Tractate Avodah Zarah, there's a discussion over what are the obligations of a, of a Ger Toshav, of the resident alien. Because now suddenly the only, the only verse that the oral law understands is having to relate to the resident alien is the permission to eat carrion. That one has to be a Ger Toshav. It cannot be a Ger Tzedek or a, you know, the righteous convert because a righteous convert must not eat not kosher meat. Okay, so when you have that, it's almost not a surprise. Within the Talmud, you will simply have a minimalist and a maximalist view. A minimalist view is, well, if the resident alien is allowed to eat carrion, he's also exempt from all the other commandments of the Torah. It's a very reasonable conclusion. Because why, why specifically exempt the, uh, an individual from this law? It must be that this law it, it reflects what all the other laws are. And therefore, the minimalist position is a ger toshav either A, must not worship idols, or what somebody mentioned a while ago in the, in the chat, the way Rambam rules, which is they must observe the seven Noahide laws. 
The seven, and this is our Rambam rules. The seven Noahide laws are simply the most basic level of monotheism and human decency. So the idea is, and that's how Rambam rules, that the Ger Toshav, somebody, a resident alien, all that he or she is obligated to do is to live in Israel as a basic good human being. And then that person is protected. Obviously, if the person is evil, even if they worship one God, then we got a problem with that person, right? Or, or if they're an idolater, then they form the negative influence that the Torah is very worried about. So going back to last week, I mentioned that the Canaanites, it's not an ethnic battle. God is against the Canaanites because they are an evil culture, evil religious culture. But hypothetically, if Canaanites were to become Noahides and get rid of their idols and be decent people, they may stay. And in fact, that is the law according to Rashi and Rambam, as well as many, many others, even Canaanites may stay as long as they become decent people. And so that becomes the law of the Ger Toshav according to the minimalist position. The maximalist position is, well, they're exempt from carrion. It must be that they're obligated to keep the other 612 commandments. Right? That's the maximalist position. In other words, you have one verse, so that, those are the two ways you can go with that. If he's permitted this, he's obviously permitted everything. The other one is, no, if he's permitted this, it's only this, right? So there is such a view in, Avoda, in Tractate Avodah Zarah. We don't rule that way. Rambam rules with the seven Noahide laws, which seem, you know, it's a much more minimalist position. And in terms of what Jewish obligations are toward the Ger Toshav, the Talmud has nothing to say because all these love him as yourself and love him because you were strangers in the land of Egypt, that refers to converts to Judaism now. So what about the Ger Toshav? All the Talmud can say is you're obligated to sustain him. It's in Masachet Psachim. Some very vague, basic sense of don't let them suffer, right? In other words, we should make sure that they're taken care of, that they're protected in society, but nothing grander than that, okay? So now let's tie it all together, and then we'll turn back to the traffic and further discussion. The oral law, and here I specifically want to start with the oral law, teaches how much God loves the convert to Judaism and how they must be treated as absolutely equal with all born Jews. The oral law bends over backwards to stress how significant this commandment is running through the whole Torah. Okay, so that's a great value that emerges from the oral law understanding of all the verses that we've looked at. The converts to Judaism are fully part of our people in every sense of the term, part of the family, they're part of the religious community. There's no difference, as Rambam said very dramatically to somebody named Ovadia, the convert in his day, he wrote him a letter, there's no difference between you and us. That is correct. That's simply what the oral law teaches in terms of the value system of the Ger Tzedek. The written law, which we don't apply as law, teaches exactly that value toward non-Jews living in the land of Israel who are decent people. Right? The written law teaches exactly that same, love them as you love yourself. They have to observe basic laws so that there's a certain sanctity of behavior that's going on over here, even though that's not the law. They don't really have to do that. But all the same, it's coming exactly to teach that value, that they're part of a community living in the land of Israel. The land of Israel has to be a holy community. Everybody living in the land of Israel has to live a holy life. And that includes observance of many, many laws of the Torah, let alone that Jews must treat them with absolute love and respect and equality under the law. So this value, even if we don't apply every single verse to the Ger Toshav, excuse me, to the resident alien, I think that these are values that are quite relevant to the present day discourse as well. I'll just start pointing toward next week's shiur by looking at some core values and a couple of really shocking texts that we'll pick up more next time. Um, one thing that the Torah sets out from the very get-go, we saw this with the law of hakel, the, the gathering that took place every seven years to study Torah, where men, women, children of Israel, as well as gerim had to attend. So this actually happened at the very beginning of the book of Joshua. Right after they cross into the land and defeat Jericho and the city, the Ai, they then go over to the area of Sh the city of Shechem and they have this whole ceremony at Mount Gerizim and Mount Eval. And they publicly proclaim parts of the Torah and they inscribe them on huge stones. It's a whole big to do. And if you read the text carefully, I gave you the reference, it's not in our source sheets, but you can look it up. In Joshua chapter 8, you will see that twice in that six verse long passage, it says that Gerim were there too. So at the very beginning of our peoplehood in the land of Israel, the book of Joshua wants to stress there were what we would call today non-Jewish people at this public acceptance of the Torah already there. So Hakel, 
which starts in the Torah, became very normative within the biblical orbit. We already saw that the law of the Torah in Numbers chapter 15 permits Jews and non-Jews to bring sacrifices in the central shrine, originally the tabernacle, later on the temple. That's something that King Solomon understood very well in source number 19 when he dedicated the temple. Or if a foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, comes from a distant land for the sake of your name, they shall hear about your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When he comes to pray toward this house, oh, here in your heavenly abode and grant all that the foreigner asks you for. Thus all the peoples of the earth will know your name and revere you, as does your people Israel. And they will recognize that your name is attached to this house that I have built. So King Solomon said, non-Jews are welcome here. If you serve God and want to bring sacrifices in this temple or pray toward this temple, you may. And simply built into the Torah value system that we already have seen. So that's that piece over. And then the Messianic vision, which we'll talk about next time, continues that trend. To my mind, the most shocking transition, which is different from the Torah, and we'll talk about a few other ones next week, including this one, is jump down to source 21 in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel envisions a future temple, future world order for the Messianic era. And one thing that he does, which is really interesting, is he redraws the map of Israel. Suddenly, all 12 tribes will return, but they will all be west of the Jordan, unlike the original Joshua scheme, where two and a half tribes chose to live east of the Jordan based on a deal that they made with Moshe himself. Okay, well, Ezekiel won't have any of that. In the future, all 12 tribes will be west of the Jordan, and the land will be distributed equally between the, among those 12 tribes. But then Ezekiel says something which I find far, you know, much more far-reaching. You shall allot it as a heritage for yourself and for the strangers who reside among you. In the future, the resident aliens will be granted land in Israel. This is amazing because the whole idea of resident alien is that you don't have land. That's kind of the point. But Ezekiel is saying that in the Messianic era, everybody, every decent person living in the land of Israel will get land. Which suddenly means that they're not really resident aliens anymore. Suddenly they are land-owning citizens, at least on some level, even if they don't officially become part of the Jewish people. So this is an, uh, an incredible messianic inclusion level from the prophet Ezekiel that we'll talk more about next week, because you better believe our commentators are going to struggle with this and give it a whole different meaning. But at least in the written law level that we've been talking about today, this is an extension along with acceptance of the Torah in the time of Joshua, welcome, being welcome in the temple, and then also just the idea of even owning land in the messianic future. So I hope that even though we don't rule like the written law, in other words, that's not what governs uh, Jewish legal behavior, halachic behavior is based on the oral law, that shouldn't at all take away the values that the written law is trying to give us. And that's what I was hoping to get across today, this absolute love and respect for decent human beings who live in the land of Israel. We have love and respect for people who live in the world who are decent people too, but the law of the Ger specifically pertains to those who live in the land of Israel under Jewish sovereignty. On that very happy note, let's turn back over to our traffic. Jews living in America are Ger Toshavim, or is that only relevant to the land of Israel? In the halachic sense, it's only the land of Israel. After all, a Jew in America is allowed to own land. Not all Jews who live in America do own land, but we're not barred from land ownership here. So it's not, it's not the same category at all. Source 16 is not consistent with calling a ger to shava ger tzedek. The word if is problematic in circumcision. Uh, you are completely correct. And the oral law simply reinterprets this whole thing. So I don't want to go through that now. It reinterprets it entirely so that it's in sync with the oral law understanding. But you're right, the plain sense of the text clashes with that. And again, that's because there is a clash between written and oral law. Okay. Rabbi Yudu, thank you for the link, everybody. Very nice. So why does the Syrian community forbid talk to the Syrians and okay? And it's, a, it's an important question, but it's not, that's, that, that is, that's, it's an internal communal ordinance rather than a halachic ruling, okay? The non-halachic Jews are welcome in any synagogue in Israel. I don't know what synagogue policies are, but I hope that people don't vet you when you walk into a synagogue anyway. I hope that people are welcome to go, and as long as they're decent and respectful, they should be welcome to pray in, in, in a synagogue. I, I, I don't think it, I think it should be no further than that. Again, I don't know if synagogues ask you at the door. I have no clue. Nochri, not ger. 21 refers to those who have children in Israel, maybe Jewish children. You're right about these things, and it's a little complicated because nochri already tends to mean non-Jew who lives in a different land. That's usually how the term is used in the Torah, and that seems even what King Solomon's talking about. He explicitly says it's somebody who lives in a faraway land rather than the ger who lives close by, who is presumed may, may come into the temple and did because the Torah already does that. So I was just saying King Solomon even extended it to all decent non-Jewish people, even worldwide. 
Okay, same question again. Okay, so I just have to say it one last time before we run out of time, which is uh, the oral law can either be from God to Moses and it goes all the way back and it's simply a different authoritative understanding of what we should do in the applied law, or it is rabbinic interpretation. And we don't know ever where, I don't know about ever, we don't know in this case and so many other cases where one stops and one starts. So I can tell you what the oral law says, and that's what we've been talking about, but I don't know how much of that goes back to the time of God and Moses. Well, God is not a time, but you know what I mean from that, from the revelation at Sinai, and how much of it goes back to the rabbinic period where the rabbis used their rabbinic authority to create a category of Ger Tzedek and then reapplied many of the Bible's verses to that category. Okay, I think that explains why several conflicting laws in the Torah are decided on because they are values and that's up for debate. I agree. Yeah, it's always more complicated than that. But I think in, in our particular case, I think the values are very loud and very clear. And I think they're very important in, in the society that we live in to just remember that even if we don't rule in halacha that this is what a ger toshav does or does not do, it's critical for us to understand what the Torah's attitude is toward decent human beings. And that's, that's really what it's all about, that they're supposed to be viewed as part of one grand people living in the land of Israel. Israel. On that very, very happy note, going once, we have a couple minutes left before we officially sign out. If you have any further questions, this is a great time to do it. Next week, God willing, will be the last part of this three-part series where we will deal with several critical messianic prophecies and are they in sync with everything we've been saying in the past couple of weeks or are they going to push certain boundaries or at least try to? And then rabbinic interpretation that, of course, is going to try to balance how that fits with the Torah's vision. So that's coming up next week. All right, so on that very happy note, then I wish everybody good health, happiness, have a wonderful week, and I look forward to wrapping this series up with you next week. So have a wonderful, have a wonderful week. Take care.